authority. Um, <laughs> welcome to the April 10th, 2019 Council Work Session. And uh, we have two items of business, but I have a request from um, Councilor Taylor to make a comment first. So I'm going to let her do that. Thank you. Um, as we all know, we've heard a lot about 5G and there's great concern. And Mike suggested we have a work session. I agree with that. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to make a motion to direct the city manager to come to us before the 15th with a list of things that we can do. We've heard a lot about what we can't do. List of things we can do, including a moratorium of some sort. That's a motion. Second that. Oh, if we can. Okay. Um, I, okay. Um, all I'm saying is timing will be tough the 15th. Right. Yeah. Be, Monday. So I think. Uh, That's just. The, so, yeah. Just so vote. you're well, I don't want to actually expend a lot of time discussing this. I think the reality is probably impossible to do this by the 15th. Um, what I, what I say, what, what we will uh, do um, is try to provide uh, what we can between now and then, knowing that it's a, it's a pretty complicated issue, as I think everybody would recognize. And so there's probably some information we can try to provide in response to that. Just know that it's not going to be not going to be uh, everything because we just won't have the, the expertise, partly. Uh, and also uh, won't be able to be comprehensive, but we will endeavor to provide what we can provide. What we can do immediately is what I'd like to know. Uh, and, and so we'll be able to do this much. There may be some additional things. We just won't know that. But the other part would come with the work session. So we will we'll try to provide what we can Thank you. at that time, assuming everybody, if you say yes to that, we'll try to do that. Okay, Mike, did you want to speak to this? I, my question was about timing, but it was also, you know, there's a lot of conversation around a moratorium. I don't know if I'm there at that, right. but do you have any kind of basic information about this, the current, your current understanding about the limit of our capacity to act um, in that regard? Yes, we and and some of that information has been provided to various individuals. So that would what uh, a lot of it. Um, uh, Mayor Venice, and we have folks that have looked into this independently, and what I anticipate doing if your motion passes is just kind of collecting up that and getting that all to you, is the stuff that we've already been able to um, answer and things. When it, I've, I've been obviously reading the emails that are coming over. If the request is can you adopt an ordinance before May 15th, your charter doesn't allow that to occur. It has nothing to do with federal law. You have a, a process in your charter that has to be followed to adopt an ordinance. So th so that's why there's there's just a number of different arms to you this. You mean April 15th, right? I'm sorry. Yes, April 15th. Yeah, by, so that's Monday. By Monday, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you. So, yeah. Alan. But that doesn't have anything to do with federal law, whether that's or not can or not. Which right. my so, understanding is we can't. Correct. So it's but it's two different questions. One would be even if we could under federal law, do could you do something, um, could you adopt an ordinance on April 15th? And the answer is no. And then we'll also provide you the information regarding what is and isn't allowed under federal law. But even for the things that could be done under federal law, you can't adopt an ordinance on Monday because of your charter. So when can we what's a date Betty put out 15th what what I don't know because I just don't know the breadth of this whole conversation uh, and so uh, again we'd be happy to, to provide what we can by the 15th if you choose to have a work session then we will try to provide additional information during a work session and so uh, it would be a matter of when we're able to schedule the work session, which would dictate a little bit around that time. What I will know more as we start thinking about how to schedule the work session is a little bit more about what it would take for us to uh, accumulate information that could be helpful at the work session. So I don't know if that's 10 days, 30 days, 60 days. I just don't know that at this moment. With that, is that understanding okay with the maker of the motion? I I got, do you, are you giving me permission to speak? <laughs> Thank you. Question. Uh, I, yes, I think I didn't say we would. I don't know whether we could do a moratorium or not. 
I did, what I'm asking is, what can we do? There is tremendous interest in knowing what we can do. And whether we can do it or not, I would like some information about what can we do and how soon. Yeah, so, and that's. So we'd be okay if the, if the council uh, moves forward, uh, we're okay with providing what we're able to provide in the next few days, just knowing that that's not going to be answer every question that everybody has, and it's not going to be a comprehensive right. uh, piece to the I understand that, but it's very complicated, and we need to know more, but we need to know what we can do. Can okay. we vote on that motion okay. then? Yep, I'm just making sure everyone's had their answer. I'm just, questions. I'm not I pushing. You, I know you're eager. I know you're That's eager. Good okay. Question. Uh, ready to vote? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. None opposed. So there you go. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I will provide yep. what we can. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Betty. All right. Thank you, everyone else. So now we're ready for work session on Vision Zero. So good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Matt Rodriguez. I'm the city engineer. I'm here with Larissa Varela, who's a transportation planner in public works engineering to talk about our uh, recently adopted Vision Zero Action Plan. Larissa is going to start off the conversation, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the actions that we've been implementing to date. Thanks, Matt. So an outline of our presentation is that um, I'm going to share an overview of the Vision Zero Action Plan. It's a five-year action plan spanning from 2018 to 2023. Um, provide you with an introduction to that plan, and then we'll talk about, as Matt mentioned, implementation that we've um, be already begun, as well as next steps as we continue forward with implementation. And so the Vision Zero Task Force developed a vision statement for the action plan that I feel captures um, the essence of the Vision Zero resolution that City Council adopted. And that vision statement is that our community values the safety of all people who use our multimodal transportation system and will take equitable data-driven actions to eliminate deaths and life-changing injuries by 2035. As a reminder, the decision-making structure for the plan is that City Council started the process by adopting the resolution in November of 2015. And then in the resolution, City Council directed the City Manager to initiate the formation of a Vision Zero Task Force to develop the action plan. So the task force developed the action plan. In addition to the task force, um, City staff put together a technical advisory committee. So that was a committee of um, agency experts at the city, uh, other agencies at the health department um, to, to provide expertise to the task force um, as we develop the plan. And then once the plan was completed, the city manager adopted the plan. And this is a timeline of um, primarily focused on plan development, um, but as I mentioned before, City Council adopted the Vision Zero Resolution in November of 2015. That winter, um, Eugene became an emerging city of what's called the Vision Zero Network. So the Vision Zero ne Network is this um, collaboration of cities across the country that are pursuing this similar Vision Zero goal. And then we took about a year to develop the action plan. So from September 2016 to 2017, we worked on the plan. Um, we held an open house that November to collect input on the draft plan. One of the things that we heard as we were finalizing the plan is the importance of equity in Vision Zero. And so we felt like we wanted to take another step and we held a focus group um, with staff from different nonprofits and agencies around town that work to represent communities of concern. And we applied an equity lens to all of the actions in the plan. So we collected their input on the draft actions and changed some of the language um, in the plan to better reflect and prioritize communities of concern. And then in 2018, we did a lot of circling back with city leadership. So in the time that we had start, started the plan, we got two new um, city leaders. So we got a new police chief, and then we got a new um, director of public works. So we wanted to take the time to circle back with them to ensure that they were fully on board and supportive of the actions that their predecessors had helped develop. Um, so we did that, and then 
recently last month the city manager adopted the plan and so this is a is a long timeline but i also wanted to emphasize that we began implementing vision zero actions as we were developing and finalizing the plan so we really began implementing vision zero in 2016 and alongside of implementing those actions finalizing the plan okay so now i'm kind of going to go over an overview of the framework for the action plan. I believe all of you should have received um, a printed out copy of the plan um, as well. So um, one of the things the action plan starts with is these guiding tenants. So the tenants help shape the actions in the plan and will continue to guide implementation. So those are to be equitable, to be data driven, and to be accountable. So for equitable, we want our streets to be safe for all people who travel on them throughout our entire city. For data, Vision Zero has been really successful in this country and across the world really um, by really starting with data to understand what are the causes of crashes and then identify the locations where there's problem areas. Um, that really helps us prioritize um, resources where there's a, a great need for them. And then um, expanding on the equity component, on the other side of the slide, I have these communities of concern. So doing communities of concern mapping is a best practice among Vision Zero cities. Um, what it is, is um, cities will map the crash data and um, figure out where the crashes are occurring, the most severe, fatal and life-changing crashes, but alongside of that, they also map equity data in communities of concern. And so what that does is that, um, for one thing, we recognize that historically, Eugene has um, had some historic disinvent disinvestments in certain communities. So we recognize that, are aware of that, and we want to do better in the future. So um, this mapping work will allow us to look at the the crash data where the crashes are occurring overlay communities of concern and help us prioritize um, project timelines and when we implement things. And so, for example, say there's two different areas in the city where there's the same number of crashes, but one area, um, there's a certain population that resides there that is a community of concern. We would prioritize the community of concern area over the area where there aren't communities of concern. And so our action plan has an action to create these maps to help help us prioritize investments in the future, and that's something that we'll begin working on this year. Oh, and up here, um, so on the slideshow, one of the, one Vision Zero city in the country is Portland. Um, I have, I, I think since you're probably most familiar with Portland and other cities that are working on Vision Zero, um, this is an example of their map. So you can see um, the orange is what's called their high crash network. That's where their um, fatal and life-changing injury crashes are occurring. Um, the circles are the intersections, and then the gray um, underlay are where their communities of concerns reside. And so they're prioritizing um, where kind of the orange streets overlap with the gray communities. And so similar to Portland, we um, developed our high crash network. So at the last Vision Zero update that we had, um, we showed you um, the most dangerous streets for the different modes of travel. So for people walking, for people biking, and for people driving. Um, since then, we've developed this high crash network. So what it is, it's a compilation of um, the 15 most dangerous streets for each mode of travel. Um, and again, this allows us to identify where the greatest need is and prioritize um, our resources to meet those needs. And similar to what other Vision Zero cities across the country have seen is that 9% um, of Eugene streets hold more than 70% of fatal and life-changing injury crashes. Um, so you can see that this is only 9% of our streets, but 70% of our Vision Zero crashes are on those 9% of streets. And then um, the meat, kind of the meat of the action plan is um, these action areas. So as part of development of the plan, we analyze a lot of crash data. So we analyze crash data from 2007 to 2015, um, all of the crashes that occurred within the Eugene urban growth boundary. Um, and what that allowed us to do is identify what are the main causes of crashes. Um, so what this plan does is it lays out the series of actions intended to address these contributing factors and these causes. So the main causes are street design. Um, how are our streets designed today um, in a way that 
makes them unsafe. Um, again, with like the high crash network, a lot of the streets are arterials, um, streets that are wider, maybe there's higher speeds. Um, so the design of our streets has a lot of impact on the safety of them. And then impairment, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then what's called dangerous behavior. So dangerous behaviors examples include failure to yield is the most common dangerous behavior that's causing these fatal and life-changing crashes. And then careless or reckless driving, distracted driving, speeding. Um, those are all behaviors that are not really helping with the safety of our streets. And so the plan's laid out um, based on those causes. And then um, in addition to that, we have strategies. So what the strategies do is they address the fundamental situations that cause crashes. Um, so without these strategies, crashes would be more severe. Um, one of the strategies is to improve data collection and analysis so that um, potentially if we can't make progress on that, it challenges our ability to understand what's causing the crashes and further analysis. And then um, if you know we don't address these strategies or use these strategies, it prevents the city from moving as quickly as possible and implementing the plan. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Matt and he'll talk about um, work we were doing towards implementation. Thank you, Larissa. Um, so as uh, she mentioned, while the Vision Zero plan is newly adopted, we've been working on aligning our practices and programs to support its implementation over the last three years. Uh, I'm gonna highlight some of the work that we've completed, some of the work that's in process, and what we're planning within the next five years. So first I wanna talk about street design, and you'll kinda notice in the slide that we call out some of the actions in the plan, for instance, SD1 is street design first action. You'll see that nomenclature through it. I probably won't talk about each one individually, but a little bit of background on um, that area of action. So the city's been aggressively constructing both standalone safety projects as well as incorporating safety into our repaving projects. As you know, with the pavement bond, we have a lot of opportunity to look at how our streets work when we repave them and think about ways that we can make them safer. We've also done a lot of work with our traffic operations folks looking at new signal timing and upgrades to signals that support safety implementation as well as traffic flow. Um, I'm gonna talk about a, a few specific examples of that on the next slide. One of the things I'm really excited to talk about is work we've been doing with ODOT and a series of other cities and counties in Oregon around changing the way we set the speeds on our streets. So we've been following a um, traffic engineering um, framework for setting speeds that was really developed you know, 50, 60 years ago, mostly based on the speed at which cars travel and the safety of cars kind of moving at the same speed together, but really not taking into account how people driving interact with people walking and biking and in urban areas, that's a really important part of safety and how we should set speeds. So um, we, working with ODOT, we're looking at reforming that. Uh, we've got approval from the Oregon Transportation Commission to actually go forward and up, uh, amend the Oregon uh, administrative rules to put this new speed setting methodology in place. We're using national guidance and studies that are gonna be coming out this year to inform it, which really looks at a safe systems approach. And that is how all users on the system interact land use, you know, driveways, all the complexity of a city to inform what the speed should be. So we're really excited about that moving forward. This is a, the high crash network map again that Larissa showed you. It's a little hard to pick out on the slide, but we've um, got a number of streets that are in bold. And I, uh, I think there's just a few that aren't, so I apologize that it's not easy to make out. Uh, the ones that are in bold have either an asterisk on them or what I just learned today is called a, a carrot, which is the <laughs> upward facing arrow. Um, the ones that have an asterisk are, are uh, streets that are on the high crash network that we either are about to or within a five year period plan to do um, significant safety investments in the streets and that we have funded. The ones that have the carrot are streets that we have applied for federal funding to do major projects on, and we just haven't quite heard whether we're gonna get it or not. Although it, at this point, it seems that likely that we'll get funding for a number of them, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. 
So some of the examples of streets that we do have funding for and, and are probably familiar to you, for instance, Willamette Street, we have the South Willamette project where we'll be finalizing that conversion from four lanes to three, have at, bike lanes are added, and then we're actually gonna be expanding uh, the sidewalks to make use of the full right away we have to make more room for people walking. We're also doing a little bit of work with driveways there to try and eliminate conflicts. So when you move from a four lane section to a three lane section, you typically have a reduction in crashes of about 30%. Although we haven't had enough time since we implemented that to statistically say what the reduction in crashes is. I think you probably heard from Chris Henry last year that we have seen a reduction in crashes since we implemented as part of the trial, the three lane section. Um, some other examples are 13th Avenue. We have a project to put protected two-way bike facility from campus to downtown in place this summer. The uh, major funding source for that is called the All Roads Transportation Safety Funding, or ARTS. That is a federal funding source that's administered by uh, the state. So uh, that project will you know, again eliminate a lot of conflicts between people driving and people biking and put that two-way facility in place. Right now it's only one way and we have a lot of cross-direction biking that occurs on the sidewalks. It makes it very, uh, very dangerous and hard for people to anticipate how people are traveling. So that's a major investment. The projects that have the carrot that I mentioned, those are all projects we applied for as part of the next round of All Roads Transportation Safety Funding. It's, it represents over $6 million in projects we applied for. They'd be built between 2022 and 2024. All of the projects we applied for made it to what's called the 150% list that ODOT keeps, meaning that they're, they're making the cut as they go down to final funding. And we're confident that most, if not all, actually make the final funding. And an example of those projects, for instance, are on River Road. Uh, we applied for two projects on that um, corridor. One is, they're fairly significant. One would be putting medians opportunistically along River Road. Another would be to put five additional flashing beacon crossings and buffering bike lanes. So the way the All Roads Transportation Safety Grant system works, it's kind of unique as it's very data driven. They give you a list of all the crashes and specific crash types. We go in and we match a what's called a mitigation strategy, some way that we can construct something to, to eliminate or reduce that crash type. So you go and you do that work and you apply and the, the public engagement kind of comes after. So um, we have talked to the community so they know that these are out there, but we know there's gonna be a public engagement process that'll happen if we get that funding. And since they're in 2022 to 2024, we have time to really engage and make sure it's the right project and work on the details of what those would look like. So in Paramount, uh, Eugene Police Department, often funded by grants from the state, has been regularly deploying high visibility driving under the influence of intoxicants enforcements during major events such as University of Oregon football games, holiday weekends, and Super Bowl weekend. To address dangerous behaviors, we've been uh, working with the community to increase awareness of Vision Zero and the importance of transportation safety in general and what people can do individually and as a community to support this implementation and just let people know what we're doing as a city as well and that this action plan, uh, well, that Vision Zero has been prioritized by council and that we're working for an action plan to implement it. Uh, the Eugene Police Department purchased two radar trailers last year, which you know tell people driving by what speed they're traveling and also tell them what the posted speed is. Those have been very well received. Um, we've had a close collaboration between Public Works and the Police Department to figure out where to put them. And the great thing about those trailers is not only do they tell people what speed they're traveling, but they actually collect data. So it's additional data we can use to focus enforcement and investments in our street system. And additionally, EPD Traffic Enforcement Unit has been focusing on hotspots in the high crash network, I-105 construction area, Coburg and Oakway, Highway 99, and then we'll be focusing on distracted driving in the month of April. For engagement and accountability, uh, the city's created a cross-departmental crash review team that meets quarterly. Um, to review severe and fatal crashes and then coordinate responses to them. 
uh, Public Works is also working with the police department to uh, brand our work under Vision Zero and provide focused messaging around enforcement and safety projects that are moving forward. Uh, I wanted to highlight that funding from the state as part of the House Bill 2017, which was the big transportation bill a couple years ago, we've been able to use a portion of that funding coming to the city to fund an additional FTE and public works that really is focusing on diving into the detail of crashes, analyzing and coming up with solutions and adding that FTE was a big part of what our likely success will be with the grant applications we have moved forward. Uh, another effort that we're working on is across the departmental team has been reviewing the potential to make some amount of emergency services and trauma center data relating to crashes available. And there's a lot of complexity to work through on privacy of healthcare data. So it's been slow and we're, we're just looking for the opportunities. But what's really helpful about getting that type of data is that the Oregon DMV crash data we get is, is really just a very focused lens there are a number of crashes that don't even make it into that system. So it gives you a fuller picture. And then you start to see things like where are people tripping on sidewalks or you know, crashing on a, a shared use path that would never show up in the Oregon DMV data. So it's, it's a little bit more information we can use to make informed decisions. And lastly, the City of Eugene Recreation Services Division com continues to be an important part of delivering bicycle education to school-aged children in our area in coordination with the local Safe Routes to School programs. This legislative session has um, actually a, a lot of potential to make meaningful change in uh, some bills around local control of how we manage our transportation system. House Bill 2702 would complement the work that we're going to be doing with ODOT to update the Oregon administrative rules on how to set speeds by allowing ODOT to delegate authority to set speeds to local agencies. And the, um, the framework of how that would be built is if it's approved, ODOT would create a local agency certification program similar to how we are currently certified to deliver federal projects saying you're qualified to do this with your staff. Cities opt into it, you're not required, but this is something in Eugene that we would really like to see move forward because we do have the staff and qualification to do that. Senate Bill 558 is another one that uh, would allow most residential streets to be lowered from 25 mile, miles per hour to 20 miles per hour through ordinance, and you can do that all at once. So it's it kind of falls outside the processes we've had to date where you have to look street by street to make any changes. And Portland actually was allowed to do that. I don't remember if it was last legislative session or the one before. And additionally, Senate Bill 559 allows cities to use, would allow cities to use automated speed enforcement along corridors. Two years ago, the state approved use of speed camera enforcement where you have red light cameras, which means you're at a signalized intersection. That's not always the best place to place speed enforcement. In fact, typically you don't want it at a signalized intersection. So this just allows more broad power to implement this on our transportation system. While we do not have any automated enforcement in Eugene right now, we are looking through the logistics of how we would implement that and what the um, priority areas for installation are. And I'll hand it back to Larissa. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I'm going to mention partner implementation. Um, so if you remember when you directed the city manager to work on Vision Zero and adopt, um, develop and adopt an action plan, you emphasize the importance of including community partners in, de in the development of that action plan. And so the action plan's complete and adopted. Now we're moving forward for implementation and we're happy to report that our partners have already stepped up to help us reach this Vision Zero goal. And so one example of that is that um, this past New Year's Eve, um, Better Eugene Springfield Transportation Best, as well as City of Eugene Parking, Mothers Against Dr Drunk Driving and the Technology Association of Oregon work together with Oregon Taxi and then Uber and Lyft to offer um, coupons and discounts for people to take a safe ride home. Um, so that really helps our goal in getting less people driving impaired. Um, so that was an exciting effort that wasn't led by the city, was led by our partners. And then in addition to that, there's other agencies that are working on um, goals to reduce or eliminate fatalities and life-changing injuries. One of those agencies is Lane Transit District, LTD. They adopt 
adopted a similar goal in one way that they're implementing their goal is they completed a pedestrian network analysis. So what that did is it looked at their um, transit system, where their stops at, and then looked at how um, do people that are riders trying to ride the bus get to those stops and where are their safety concerns with um, riders accessing um, stop locations in the bus. And so that's a project where LTD's developed it and now we're gonna work with them to look at those stop locations, look at those areas of concern and figure out from an infrastructure investment, sidewalk investment, crossing investment, how can we help make those locations safer um, as two agencies working together. And then we also recently, um, over the past couple of years, we, um, a new coalition was established led by LCOG, Lane Council of Governments, that's the Safe Lane Coalition. So it's a collaboration of agency partners across the region, that includes the county, city of Springfield, city of Eugene, um, the health department, LTD, um, all working together to share with each other what we're doing to work towards our Vision Zero goals um, and educate and just really work across um, agencies to get the greatest return on investment for our work, really. Um, so we're excited that our partners are helping us implement Vision Zero already. And then I'm going to talk about measuring our progress. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, one of the guiding tenets of the plan is to be um, transparent and accountable to our community. And so one way that we're gonna do that is we've committed to publishing an annual report on Vision Zero um, to share successes that we've had each year um, implementing the plan. We've also identified these benchmark measures to check in on our progress. So we didn't wanna wait until 2035 to check in and see if we've successfully eliminated fatalities and life-changing injuries. Um, we recognize that we want to do that before 2035. So we developed two benchmark measures. One is um, we're hoping to see a 25% decrease in deaths and life-changing injuries by 2023, um, and then a 50% decrease by 2028, and this is using a rolling average over the years. And then um, we also plan to update the action plan every five years. Okay, next steps moving forward um, with implementation. So we are planning a Vision Zero celebration. Now that the plan is adopted, we wanna celebrate it with the the greater community. So we're gonna be working with Better Eugene Springfield Transportation to um, hold a celebration this spring that um, talks about the plan, but also lets everyone know how we're kind of busting out the door with implementation to move this forward. Um, one of the things that we're gonna be promoting, although it's already currently available, is a web application for Vision Zero. So this web application allows members of the public to go online and to report concerns that they have on our transportation system. Um, and then that what that does is it allows us to look at concerns that are people having and compare that to the kind of crash data that we already have. So it's really supplemental. So the crash data, you know, we know that those crashes have already occurred, but there could be areas where people are experiencing what's called a near miss um, or, you know, the area is unsafe, but it might not have necessarily triggered or caused a crash yet. So this will allow us to compare our Vision Zero crash data with where people are feeling unsafe and uncomfortable um, and, and prioritize how we use our resources to address those concerns. And then as Matt already mentioned, we more work to do during the 2019 legislative session. Um, and then a key aspect of continuing to implement Vision Zero is to put together a leadership committee, which will most likely be a combination of members from the task force and from the technical advisory committee um, to ensure that the plan continues to be implemented strongly. And so things that they'll work on is um, just cross-departmental and interagency collaboration, um, as well as thinking really about capacity building. How do we build capacity within the city to implement Vision Zero, but also how do we build capacity as a community and continue to work together to implement and reach this goal? So with that, we can take comments and questions. Great. Thank you very much. I have three counselors in the queue, four counselors in the queue, uh, Mike, Betty, Alan, and then Jennifer. So take it away, Mike. Thank you, Mayor. What do you got before you? <clears throat> Mike does have some time. <laughs> Uh, on the street design, thank you very much for the presentation, by the way, and for all the work. The street design safety projects sheet that was up there that lists <coughs> each of the streets. Can we go to that for a second? My question is, do the little round circles designate um, 
intersections of concern or specific projects you already have planned? They're intersections. So that we, we not only identified the high crash network for corridors, but the high crash intersections. Right. So, so those, those dots are, are challenging yes. intersections. Because for example, I see one of them, so in other words, you know, 5% of them that are up there, one of them's Crescent and Gillum, which I live near and I can testify is a dangerous intersection. But I don't see either of those streets listed on the streets of concern. Yeah, so I, I think in an effort not to have too many uh, streets up on the screen at once, we didn't put the intersections up there as well, but that's a good point. So if you look in the plan, right. it not only has the corridors of concern, but it has a list of the top intersections of concern as well. I'm sorry, I'm losing time here while he's talking, if I could, because I have a mm -hmm. bunch of questions. Um, it, it, so my question is, my next question is that there are so many um, streets in South Eugene comparatively to North Eugene. Is, is there a reason for that? That are well, of concern? It's, it's based on crash data. So this is what the data is telling us. As far as why that is, I think it's probably individual to each street. So we looked at the streets that were most dangerous for each mode, as Larissa said, and then we aggregated that data into this map. So some of it in one location now might be because most crashes are involving vehicles. Another um, street, it could be most crashes are involving vehicles and pedestrians or vehicles and bikes. So it's kind of specific to the street. That brings me to my next question, which is the individual education efforts that you were talking about and the near miss pieces that you were talking about. Can you talk about the balance between the need to impact the driving and, and transportation environment versus the need to change individual behaviors versus the need to change driver behaviors? Where is the, what's the level of effort on each of those? Yeah, so there's opportunity in all of those. Uh, I probably don't have maybe as solid as answer as you'd like, but the way that the way Vision Zero works typically is you want to change the environment first if you can. The, the foundational principle of it is that you put uh, you have shared responsibility between the people that manage the system and the people that use it, which is a, a change from traditional transportation safety, which is typically put the onus on the people using the system. So what that means is when we can, knowing that it's expensive to change the way streets work, that is the first thing you'd like to do. Because if streets are informing people through the cues of their design of how to use them, then you need less effort from education and enforcement. But again, knowing that we're not gonna be able to change all the streets in town at once, that's why other tools like potentially automated enforcement can change the way a street works before we can get down to all the physical improvements we may need to make. Talk about dangerous pedestrian behaviors that you're making mm -hmm. an effort towards. Um, so, y you know, uh, I think failure to yield, no matter who it is, someone driving, someone walking, someone biking, disregarding a traffic signal, those are always dangerous behaviors. What we do always know, though, is that people that we would consider vulnerable walking and biking, if they're in a, a crash with a car, end up getting yeah. hurt worse, right? So, um, what about people who dance in the middle of the street? Do they have the, responsibility? You know, we don't have a lot of data on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, just, I, I hate to be so silly, but you understand my point. Sure, yeah. At what point is it the responsibility of the pedestrian and how should we treat that? Yeah, so um, again, I mean, our part of why enforcement is a part of this is that we want to make sure that people are following the rules of the road no matter what user they are. And what are we doing to make sure they're following the rules of the road So as pedestrians? Yeah, so that's where enforcement comes in and knowing that... Um, that resource is limited, but we want to work together to understand where the crashes are happening, what the causes are. That's why we have the crash team meetings to determine how we might follow up with enforcement. So for instance, um, in the past, uh, our police department has done targeted pedestrian crossing enforcement where they go to a crosswalk and they'll uh, issue warnings or citations for people that are not following yielding law, but they also are talking to pedestrians that don't follow the rules as well. So it's not just about cars, it's about everyone following the rules when they're out there doing a targeted enforcement. What sort of things do they talk about, just out of curiosity? Well, pedestrians that aren't following the rules. I think they give them 
warnings uh, is my understanding. I can't speak specifically to that because I'm not part of the police department, but yes. when we check in on it, we talk about that. Standing out. <laughs> the, the, the other thing I would say though, is that in part of what street design, we want to do with street design is you want to lower speeds. And if you're lowering speeds, no matter who may make the mistake or you know, intentionally, I guess, if they want to disregard the traffic law, the outcome is less severe. Right, so we know that it's if uh, if someone's driving at 40 miles an hour, they're more than twice as likely to have a fatality if they hit someone walking than if they're going 30. There's like an exponential sure. risk. So even if the driver's not at fault, if we can build a system where people driving are going slower, where we think there's risk of a crash with a pedestrian or someone biking, that will reduce the severity of the outcome. So that's kind of part of the theory of Vision Zero. Awesome, thank you. So, Lieutenant Jennifer Bills, uh, Eugene Police. I oversee the Traffic Enforcement Unit. Um, I, I think to, to echo what was said, people, human nature is to drive as fast as you possibly can and uh, on the street that's in front of you. Um, if you look at some of those corridors out in South Eugene, they're shared with both bikes and pedestrians and their school zones. I'm looking at Alder Street. There's also a really heavy population in that area. Um, that's one answer. The other answer is simply called the lug nut rule. Uh, the biggest lug nuts will win and bicyclists <laughs> and pedestrians tend not to. Uh, vehicles tend to uh, <laughs> if there's gonna be a crash between those two opposing forces. So we've been very supportive. Um, the traffic calming devices such as the woonerfs, which are the traffic circles or the indentations that go into the road really do have an impact on vehicles traveling in those areas. In terms of the conversations that you asked, what do we have with pedestrians? We talk about the fact that if they are to be struck by a car, they're going to lose. And there is a responsibility when you step into the street. Um, also responsibility on the motorist as well as responsibility on the cyclist uh, to talk about their awareness and situational awareness of where they're at. Um, Forgive me for interrupting. Sure. My point in asking the question is, yeah. if our goal is to lower the actual contact of those situations, it seems like all of our efforts are going on only to one half of the responsible party without talking about who's responsible for the, the impact or the connection of those potential conflict situations. Wouldn't it be wiser to do more to minimize all who could be at fault for a lack of a better word? Certainly if we could have enough resources to go after everybody in the equation, but when you have uh, limited resources, you go over towards the, the biggest points of impact. And for us, it's those high traffic intersections where you're going to have the largest amount of serious physical injury, life-changing injury, or, um, or fatality. And so we focus our attention to the areas where we can have the greatest impact first, and then hopefully there's a trickle-down effect where it's going to uh, have greater impact elsewhere. Makes sense, thank you. Last question, out of all of this, how, maybe this is better for the manager, how much are we budgeting towards this effort in both expenditure with grants and everything we're talking about in staff time since first implementation in 15? Roughly, rough guess. This would be a great uh, answer by the city engineer probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't think, I, I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have that number you offhand. Have a wild guess that I, no one will hold you to. It, it's it's hard to put. <laughs> I would say happens. when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about projects and that there's a portion of them that it, they're multi-objective, right? Like I said before, we might be repaving a street, but within that, we can do some changes that are really meaningful to how it'll work. Sure. Um, you know, so I, I don't have a specific number for you. I can tell you that it's probably. <clears throat> Um, in the millions, but that's, you know, that's, <coughs> that's mostly investment in the street system. Okay. And again, it's staff time. Yeah, mostly the, the projects, but yes, there is sub substantial staff time. And the more we can uh, gain, and a lot of it has been building up the tools. So, like I said, we've done a lot of work on classifying and building spreadsheets on the um, the intersections that have the most injury crashes, what exactly that movement is. So we have a menu to work from now that where we can start applying proven mitigation factors and ODOT maintains a list. They've got average percentages of reduction. It's a data-driven thing we can use. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, Betty. Thank you. I think, <clears throat> I think it's obvious that we could spend hours talking about this. <laughs> 
and I could spend a few hours myself just to, with questions and so forth. I think reducing the speed is really important, and I'm glad to hear that we may be able to do that. If we had this 20 mile per hour speed limit everywhere, there wouldn't be so much problem with, get, with getting uh, people to slow down for school zones, perhaps. I have been almost hit when I slow down for school zone speed. Um, I wonder, I have a lot of questions too, but are you going to do anything about the driveways on Willamette Street? There have been talk of that for 15 years at least. Sure. So uh, as part of that project, we've been having conversations with the property owners and tenants along Willamette Street on where the opportunities are to reduce driveways. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of those conversations are still in progress. Our goal, as much as we can without you know, impacting the businesses in a way that's really gonna be negative to them being able to survive, is to work with them to reduce driveways. There, there are some businesses that have four driveways accessing their property. So we're talking with those business owners and saying, okay, how can we make this work? Giving them some design options to say, okay, if we remove this driveway here, does that help you still maintain circulation and, and keep your business viable? So we're trying to do it opportunistically as much as we can in, in collaboration with the property owners. But yes, we do have some driveways that will, driveway changes that will occur on South Willamette Street. There are, they are really an impediment to pedestrian. Um, one of the best things that was done on Willamette was putting in the stoplight at um, 25th, I think it's 25th, isn't it? Where between uh, Capella's and the bank, it gave access to more businesses so that you could be parked at one and go to the other without <coughs> driving. Um, I wonder if there, you have any statistics on the number of pedestrians who've been hit by cars in the downtown core. Not, not off the top of my head, no. We can I don't, definitely I don't have any numbers, but over the years, I've personally known a number of people who've been hit by cars and whose partners or spouses or children have been hit by cars downtown. And I think that the right turn on red is a big problem because there are people who think, who don't think of it as right turn permitted on red, they think of it as right turn required on red. Oh. And I personally have been crossing 10th and Oak at least twice when cars have come at me honking because I was crossing on a walk sign because they wanted to turn faster. So I, I think we could use more attention to downtown yeah. vehicles than we have had. I have suggested in the past that we have a study group composed of Gee, the time goes faster when I talk than when Mike talks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that we consult all the neighborhood groups because I hear a lot about traffic problems and I think every neighborhood has, it's still moving. Every neighborhood has problems. <laughs> I know, I know. Every neighborhood has problems. Um, and I think it would be good to know what they are in all over town. And there may be different different places. Also, looking for for solutions that other cities have found, yeah. and one I've brought to council before, but that I heard about, was in one city that the people, if they see a car going fast, they take a they send a picture. The city does it, but the the residents give them the information. Like little Emily lives on this side of the street, and Patricia lives on the other side, and they're three years old, and they're best friends and you were seen, send the person a letter with a picture of them and say, you were seen speeding down this street. And they say that that could be very effective. And I'd like another round if there's time, but I don't think there'll be time. Oh, there'll be time, yes, all right. Okay, Alan. Yeah, this is really good work, great work. I, I like the report. I really like the methodology that you guys, how you put this together where you, uh, you talked about the causes, and then you talked about using the data, where these things occur, and then what types of actions you could do, and then more specifically, and then implementation, and then performance measurements. So I like that methodology. It made a lot of sense to me. It was very well, well laid out and clear. Um, 
One of my favorite graphs in this report is, is, is one on page 11 with the speedometers at, at 20 miles an hour, 10% likelihood of fatal or severe injury. Just by increasing 10 miles per hour, it quadruples to 40% chance of being fatal or, or severely injured. And another 10 miles per hour, it's 7 percent or seven times as much just by going 20 miles an hour more really brings home the fact that speed is really the big big deal about uh, a lot of this uh, which is probably why there's not a lot in the downtown area there aren't any downtown intersections there because everybody's going pretty slow um, the the, uh, the the where is related to the, the crash data on page 25 you got a table and then you have three graphs on 26, 27, 28. So can you kind of describe how you took this data to determine where we were going to focus our attention? A little bit more detail. Um, yeah, so literally this is uh, the Oregon DMV crash data. I think we took for a seven year period. Is that seven years. Yeah, yeah, or maybe it's eight, yeah. but 20, 2007 through 2015. And we went through, and um, that data has location and it has severity of injury if there is an injury. So we could take those items and then we could also separate out by people walking, biking, and, you know, in a car. So we, we use that information to look, again, not only at intersections but corridors for each of the three modes and then in aggregate that have the most injury crashes. So the prioritization, well, I guess one nuance to the prioritization that's good to know is that for biking and walking, we not only um, looked at serious injury, we actually also expanded it to moderate injuries. And the reason that we did that is that when you're walking and biking, whether it's a major injury or a moderate is, is a very slight difference. Um, if you're in a car with more modern safety systems, you know, you can actually separate out speed and your um, exposure a little bit differently. But if, if you're not wrapped in that safety system, uh, it's it's just a kind of a hair's breadth, whether it's moderate or, or major injury or death. So calculating all that using this data, that's the 23 mm -hmm. intersections with those circles on the yeah. map. And then the next graphs are d identifying the streets that were people walking or, or driving or biking where they had the most, and that they also end up being on the on the list of wares yes. to focus the attention. So the I, I like the action plan, although they're, they're, um, they're still at a pretty high level. Um, and so I'm wondering how uh, do you get, turn these actions into specific projects uh -huh. uh, and then Specifically, how do those get into the CIP? And then specifically, once they're in the CIP, how do they get prioritized inside the CIP? How do they get mentioned multi-objective projects? And mm -hmm. so how does Vision Zero impact the CIP? It's not dissimilar to the question I asked you about the climate recovery ordinance. Yeah. How does how does it impact what we're doing in the CIP? Do these get moved up? That's a great question. So um, we haven't got there yet completely yet. Yeah, yeah. So one the thing, next, one thing I want to highlight is although we have a high crash network and we have a list of high crash intersections, Vision Zero isn't just about those. So we want to put priority there because that's where people are getting the most uh, injuries and the most people are being killed. But Vision Zero is really about safety across all the the streets in our city. So we we are looking at those. Um, so a lot of where it begins is even more data analysis within our staff. So like I said, we were able to uh, add a position in public works where we're literally looking through all the crash data and putting together the list of the top places where left turn turns have related injuries and you know just very specific types of crashes that we can look at and figure out, first of all, is this an operational change we can make? So one example would be Kinsrow and MLK, which is on the list. And what we were seeing there, because it had a permissive left, meaning you could turn left if you were headed towards Springfield at Kinsrow off of MLK, as long as you thought there was a gap in traffic that was big enough to turn. Well, 
there's two lanes, people were going fairly fast, they were not judging that correctly and we were getting a lot of injuries there. So we were able with our operations staff to go out and change it to just protected lefts. You can only turn left when you're the only person moving out there. So we would expect that that's going to reduce the, the crashes and injuries that are occurring based on, on practice. So we have a lot of those that we can try to pick off just opportunistically, what can we do within our own resource? When we start about thinking about major investments, that's where we start having to do corridor by corridor analysis. So when I talked about this all roads transportation safety process, there's a um, manual called the Highway Safety Manual that defines the process by which you analyze crash data and come up with solutions and understand what the potential change is after you do the solutions. That's basically what that application process was. So our pilot for how to look at a corridor was River Road because it's one of only a few streets that showed up as a high crash corridor for people walking, biking, and driving. Um, so, and we're having a neighborhood planning conversation there too. So we thought this is a great opportunity to look and see what we can do there and talk with the community about it. So we went through and basically did a corridor level analysis to understand the changes that could be impactful. So that is something that we want to leverage and basically do for every corridor we have over time, starting with the ones that are more refined internal data show are most problematic. When we do that, we can look for grant opportunities, which, you know, come through the, the IGR um, as far as asking for grant money. Once we have the money, then they get programmed in the CIP. When we're talking about our own local dollars, um, a lot of the money that you'll see is part of the pedestrian bicycle portion of the street bond, although it's not programmed specifically in the CIP, goes towards some of the smaller projects that we identify as priority for safety improvements for walking and biking. Um, there's the work that's done as part of the pavement project. So again, we don't always, well actually we do in the first two years in the CIP have all those paving projects. If there's safety work we see that needs to be done with those, we will try to do it to the best of our ability with the paving project as programmed in the CIP. One of my goals for the next round, the next time we do the CIP, similar to our conversation about the CRO, is that we um, take another look at our prioritization methodology, taking into account all the relevant city goals and have a, a more transparent way that we can convey to the public of how this project was elevated to be put in the CIP. But in short, there's a lot of background calculation and study that goes into the getting it there. Good. Uh, hold on, I'm just gonna interject because it's two minutes to one and we have another topic. So I'm gonna ask to uh, contain your questions a little bit and maybe contain your responses a little bit and <laughs> we'll try to get through quickly so we can get to the next one. Okay. That, that makes total sense to me. When I was doing plans for agencies as a consultant, the first thing they'd always inevitably ask for in the action plan was, what are the low cost, no cost things we can do? Let's focus on those, then we'll go into the big ticket items later. So that makes sense to me that this ends up getting, we focus on those, but then also put in the CIP to look at the more uh, higher price ticket items that can then be prioritized within the CIP. And that's not supposed to be in this plan, so I get that, that's in, that's, uh, but that's how they connect. So that makes sense to me, thanks. Okay, Jennifer. Yeah, I'll try to make it quick. There's a lot of people in my neighborhood who are concerned about sidewalk infill, especially around schools. There's three schools. Um, who have a lot of sidewalks who, that aren't infilled in areas where kids are required to walk because they don't qualify to ride the bus because they're too close. Is that factored into anything in here when you're looking at prioritization? So we have an action about um, working with the school district Safe Routes to School programs on safety projects within the school area boundary. And, uh, and we worked with the Safe Routes to School program regionally to come up with a prioritization of all their projects within the districts. So it is something that has a related action and that we work very closely with them on moving forward. Okay, and so would that give any of the projects some sort of priority, like extra bonus points, if they're in those school zone areas? That, that would be part of the prioritization we still need to fully develop is how we you haven't figured out. that out yet is the answer, is that right? Yeah. Okay. There's more work to do there. My second question is, it looks like we're getting a lot of data um, through all this. Are there going to be ways that we can use this information to help future development? So doing things before we are starting to add density in areas rather than being reactionary? Um, well, it's going to show us what's happening now, but 
we can also see from the mapping tool Larissa talked about what people may have concern about even if the crashes aren't developing. I think we have a separate conversation that we'll need to continue about how we look at investments in streets that have development on them that aren't fully improved to city standard. Okay, thank you. Emily. Thank you. Well, Jennifer pretty much said what I wanted to say. I'm concerned about sidewalks, um, especially when they're not there because people walk in the streets and there's more chance for unfortunate interaction. And looking ahead where we are developing and there aren't sidewalks, as we're developing, there'll be more cars and more pedestrians and they'll walk in the street and more people will get hit. So I just hope that that's something that's it's at the you know top of our minds that we're not dealing with what is right now. We're dealing with what's coming. And as we're building all these houses and the people are coming, everything's going to get busier and more condensed. And I think sidewalk infill becomes more and more critical. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. Obviously, we could talk for many more hours about this topic. Really appreciate how thorough your responses are, and the report was excellent. So to be continued at some point, thank you very much. And Mayor, what I would also say, I'm sure Matt and Jen and Larissa and others on staff would be happy to sit down with any counselor if you have more specific questions or thoughts or ideas as well. So please feel free to reach out to either one, any of them. I'm not going to next thing. Oh, oh, you're getting in queue already. Oh, my goodness. Okay, the pressure, <laughs> the pressure is intense at this end. Yeah, you <laughs> have, you have. It's all your fault. Oh okay, goodness. all right, <laughs> on to the... <laughs> so, let's see. Gotta be second. <laughs> so, in this case, I believe I'm shifting gear, so I'm closing the city council meeting and opening a meeting of the Urban Renewal Agency. Michael, All right. Whenever you're ready. Are okay, we great. doing? I want to be on the list too. I guess I'm okay. this early. All right. Did you say something to yes, us? Okay. To Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. <laughs> um, I'm Michael Kennison uh, with the Community <laughs> Development Division, and I'm here with Emily Proudfoot with Parks and Maurizio Bodolico with our Purchasing Division. And we're here to talk to you about uh, funding for the Riverfront Park and Plaza. And uh, time permitting, we wanted to start a conversation with you about other investment opportunities uh, in the Riverfront Urban Renewal District. Um, and so we've, um, to make sure we have time uh, to discuss the park funding and take action on that item, we're structuring the conversation um, uh, kind of in two pieces. So we're going to talk about the park um, and the plaza first, and we'll allow you an opportunity to um, take action, and then um, we'll see what time looks like after that, and we'll, we'll talk about other opportunities um, um, as time allows. We have set an ambitious goal of completing the Riverfront Park uh, in time for when Eugene takes the world stage uh, for the 2021 World Track and Field Championships. Uh, and we're now reaching a critical point in the park development process where we're wrapping up design and we're getting ready to actually do um, site work and so that we can stay on that uh, timetable. We need to have certainty around the park budget to keep moving forward, basically. Approval of a budget for the park and plaza um, are also a contingency of um, the first closing with Williams and Dame on the downtown riverfront project. And we also have a commitment to complete construction of the plaza before we can close on the remaining parcels um, there. So we're at a point where we need clarity around funding um, for these elements uh, to ensure we can meet those commitments. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emily. I'll, I'll back up just for a moment. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm happy to be back here today to talk about finalizing funding for the Downtown Riverfront Park. And uh, in this slide, and we've shown it to you before, um, the Downtown Riverfront Park is the green hatched area, and then the purple star is the Riverfront Plaza project. Um, so we've spent some time with several of you individually and also as a group back on March 11th uh, talking about our broad scale public engagement, rich park, our rich park design and the technical complexities of the project. Um, in general, there's a ton of uh, excitement about the project in the community and we're delighted to be planning on moving forward with construction this summer and then completion by 2021. Um, as a reminder, again, we're bringing two different projects for funding consideration. The first is a three-acre downtown riverfront park, and then the second is the plaza, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Um, 
Our project estimate for the Riverfront Park portion is 14 million. So far, we've secured 9 million in parks, stormwater, and transportation capital funds for the project. So we're bringing back a request for 5 million uh, of investment of urban renewal dollars for your consideration. We've shared this project, uh, project timeline with you before, but as Michael stated, and as just a brief reminder, we're still on track to begin the first season of construction this June for utility work and bank enhancement work. Uh, and then from there, we'll move into the second season of construction work to complete all the developed components of the park. And so to meet this timeline, we're working now to secure all of the identified needed funding uh, so we can green light the project team to complete the design work and continue our project work toward completion in 2021. Uh, upon completion of the Riverfront Park, we'll be moving into construction of the downtown Riverfront Plaza. And for this project, we're asking you to consider four million of urban renewal uh, dollars to uh, finalize the design and move forward with construction likely after the 2021 festivities. Um, this funding includes contributions to the LID for the downtown riverfront infrastructure work. And we anticipate starting back in on finalizing this design work um, on this, on the plaza project within the next probably nine to 12 months. So uh, from here, I'll let Maurizio take it and talk about uh, available funds. All right, thanks, Emily. Uh, so I'll be providing just a quick recap here of the financial capacity of the Riverfront District. Uh, so as you can see on the top half of this slide, uh, it is estimated the district may have approximately $18.1 million in total financial capacity uh, to fund new expenditures through FY24 when the district is expected to sunset. Uh, so that amount represents an estimate of not only existing district resources, but plus projected revenue through the end of fiscal year 24. Uh, so as we talked about before, the district has two types of revenue, as you see here. Uh, so starting with tax increment revenue, which comes from property taxes, uh, the uncommitted tax increment amount of $10.3 million that you see here uh, is an estimate of how much tax increment uh, revenue may be available through FY24 for new expenditures after all committed expenses are funded. Um, the other type of revenue in the district is program revenue, uh, and those are dollars from non-property tax sources, uh, such as land sales and rental income. Uh, the $7.8 million figure you see here is after setting aside $1 million for loans in the district. Uh, so moving on to the bottom half of the slide, uh, if we allocate $5 million of district resources for the park and $4 million for the plaza, uh, that would leave an estimated $9.1 million available for other projects uh, through FY24. And with that, I'll turn it back to Michael to wrap up. So the, um, the, the District Advisory Committee, uh, known as the River Guides, met on March 21st and recommended using uh, $5 million of Riverfront Urban Renewal Funds to build the park and set aside $4 million um, as an initial investment for the plaza. Um, and consistent with that uh, recommendation um, today, you're being um, asked to um, authorize use of $5 million of the Riverfront funds um, for the park and uh, $4 million for an initial investment in the, in the plaza. Um, and um, I think uh, with that, we'll give you time to answer any questions and, and uh, take action. Excellent, thank you. So I have Betty, Mike, Jennifer, and then Alan. Take it away, Betty. Okay, when I asked to speak, I was going to say that since I think the parks people bet with all the counselors, we probably don't need a lot of discussion at this point and that we could just vote. <laughs> I, I, since we were running out of time, that's why I wanted to speak. That's, that's all I have to say. Good work, thank you. Well, well let's see if that's true. So, uh, Mike. <laughs> thank you, Mayor, very much. Uh, First of all, I see the nine million remaining under the cap from all sources, um, and we can, as Denny it so often reminds me, we can alter the cap should we, this council decide to do so. However, my question is to the manager. As you are currently negotiating for the EWEB administration building for non-city hall purposes, <laughs> are you 
planning to or considering the idea of any of these funds from the Urban Renewal District towards the purchase of that building? So what uh, uh, we don't know yet, and the reason why I say that is uh, we will come back to the council uh, relatively soon, and relatively soon means sometime in the we hope in the next 30 to 60 days, an executive session to get more guidance on how you would like us to proceed with negotiations. And uh, part of that conversation could also be the use of these dollars within those negotiations. And so we need more guidance from the, from the council before we enter into any more negotiations. Okay, awesome news because that has always been my hope that we will do that. And what I don't want to do in voting for this is put that capacity at risk in any way. So I'm just looking to be assured that both with remaining funds and our ability to alter the cap, we are not putting that capacity at any risk. Right, so the, the 9.1, if you take action today, um, the 9.1 is still discretionary dollars that are not appropriated yet by the city council. And so you will have at whatever point you choose to appropriate the $9.1 million. Yeah, yeah, and I, you could then uh, do something different with the cap at any time you would want to do that as well. Which would give us, say, if we wanted to spend $15 million, we could, in theory, alter the cap and use the $9 million and get there. Am I right? Yeah, I think what we would uh, I keep here, looking yeah, over here. I think the answer uh, uh, yeah. generally is yes. The the key on that would be is how much revenue is actually generated, which might make a difference on caps and things like that in terms of uh, anything you choose to do. But in in principle, yes. We deal with this at a high level. Thank you, sir, very much, and not at an expenditure of specifics level, which is as it should be on a policy basis. And I'm more ecstatic about the development of this area than probably anything that this council has done in a long time. But as someone in North Eugene who has worked for years with residents to develop a park in North Eugene, who has seen residents spend countless hours and, and, and money of their own to help design because we didn't have the ability to do so with the city. And then for us to spend two and a half million dollars on consultation fees for this park rubs me really raw. And I, I have to tell you, we actually, I, I'm, I was very happy when the council agreed that we should put all of the other necessary efforts to developing Stryker Field because it was actually promised to the folks in North Eugene. That disproportionate kind of nature is, is a little bit hard for me to, to deal with today. And I just needed to say that out loud. And what you'll be receiving soon from Sarah Maderi will be sort of more detail about the timing and the schedule and all of that around Stryker Field. So you'll be getting that soon, which will um, also uh, help land that project for you as well. Last question then, if we had between the two and a half million we're paying out, the staff time and permitting of the 650K, how, how much money just around planning the creation, not actually the building, but the planning and creation of this park will we spend three and a half or whatever that, I mean, would you cap it at the 3.15 or would you add in some of the utility and construction, you know, any of the other pieces as a part of in-house and, uh, you know, it's, planning? I mean, so we're looking at a $10 million construction budget, right? Mm -hmm. So anything outside of that, so there is some, it's around four. The utility moving is pretty significant, um, you know, and I'll add again, um, this is a site that's been, you know, had an industrial use on it for a hundred years. Yeah. So it, it's technically complex. We have a ton of due diligence and studying to do. And then on top of that, it's along a river, along the Willamette River, which is highly regulated and in a place that, you know, I don't know if you've visited it in the last couple of days, but it's pretty busy down there. So yeah. <laughs> wet too, I hear. a yeah. little wet. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and that's the kind of level of study where we're doing that kind of hydraulic modeling and what really trying to if? figure out when yeah. we have a lot of water, what does that mean? Yeah. And it takes time and, and money and real, and, you know, and we want to have that data to be sure that we're building something that's absolutely 
has the, you know, the longevity that we want it to have and maintains the health, safety, and welfare of the I public. I couldn't agree more in isolation. You're absolutely right. But compared to other priorities, it rubs me raw because it makes it seem like this has much higher priority than other residents' important needs. So thank you very much. Okay. Jennifer. Thank you very much. So, um, so obviously your guys' job is to manage and make wonderful and amazing parks. And obviously this is an amazing park. I think we've all been excited about the design since it started. But I see my job as making sure that our policy and values connect with our decisions and that we're keeping the ship going the direction we want to go and making course corrections when we need to. And for me, I want to be on board with this, but I'm having trouble because I see that we're building six new parks in our, in our new recent plans. Um, this one is getting significantly more money, like multiple times more money than the other parks even combined. Um, you've identified 25 potential areas where we have already decided we need new park acquisitions, which we don't even have yet. And there's 12 additional undeveloped parks that aren't even on the list to get developed, which we haven't identified funds for at all. And then we're in a in the riverfront, which is a very nice area, it's gonna be great, I agree with Mike, but they're already in a park-rich area. I mean, they can literally go in every direction, people who are visiting or living in this area, and get to a park. They can go down to Skinner's Butte and River Play, which is getting an additional um, improvement. They can go the other direction and get to Franklin and the Autzen Bridge. If they don't like that, they can go across the bridge to Autzen and get into Alton Baker. If they don't like that, they can walk a few blocks to the park blocks or to the new little area that Williams and yep. Dane is pr producing. So for me, it's really hard for me to see how in an already park-rich environment where this is clearly not going to be a neighborhood of low socioeconomic folks, we're adding this very expensive, world-class park. It just seems like a huge equity issue to me. Yep. And I'm just not at a point where I can say that, and 14 million isn't, I mean, you're asking for 14 million for the three acres and then 4 million for the one acre plaza. And the 4 million, I, I think I understand this right, is initial money. That's, you're going to be coming back for more money. I really want to be on board with this, but I just can't, it just doesn't, it doesn't pencil out to me to being a fair, a fair use of funds when we Look at people who, I'm an out, a mile and a half from a city park, and I know there are people in much worse situations than me. How do I go to those residents and those neighbors and tell them that this is justifiable when they know they're not getting a park within walking distance in the next 10 or more years in their neighborhood? I, if I can't answer that question to folks, if I can't look them in the eye, I don't know how I can vote for this. So maybe you can help me with that. I'm sure these are things you guys have also thought about, so. She said my thing more directly. That was cool. Um, well, I, I'm happy to provide a little context. Um, I think uh, the, a downtown, you know, a redevelopment of the downtown riverfront has been in our planning for over 30 years. I think it's, you know, reconnecting the downtown to the river has, you know, been a huge priority for many decades. So from a bigger picture planning perspective, it's, it's been a vision. Um, I think, uh, We've also recently completed a 30-year vision for parks and recreation in Eugene, and with the generous, um, you know, affirmation of the voters, we just received, a, you know, $38 million, which will likely, you know, over time with leverage funds end up being a $50, $50 million investment um, across the community in recreation centers and, um, and new parks and park renovations across the city. Um, I think, you know, we heard a really big message around caring for what we have. So, you know, over the last 20 years, we've doubled the size of our system that haven't, you know, haven't been able to take care of it in a way that we needed to. The levy is going to really help us do that, but it's had an immediate impact. You know, it's had a it's had a long term impact on the quality of our parks and the quality of the infrastructure there. And we're having to invest a lot of money to bring it back up to what it was before. So this is a you know this is a a, a bigger question around our existing system and then um, and then geographic equity for sure you know we and 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 so to you know 
be able to fulfill the vision of really creating total equity across the system, it's gonna take a while because we have a lot of stuff to fix first to even take care of the system we have. And then I think down the road, we'll be able to invest capital dollars in expanding our system, acquiring more property and developing parks. So that's the big picture. Um, you know, the downtown riverfront in, you know, the park is fundamental to the redevelopment of the site and we have some, you know, um, direction to build a park to make that happen. And it's now part of our deal points with WEA and a few other things. So there's a, there's a lot of policy, a lot of planning, um, you know, where you sit with the equity piece is, is um, you know, is where you sit, and I understand it. Because um, it's, yeah, it's just as, yeah, I mean, it's just as frustrating, frustrating for park staff. You know, we would love to have hundreds of millions to be able to develop parks across the city, and, and that's, you know, we're just not there yet. And, and just really on a sort of a fiscal perspective, the dollars that are represented in this park are urban renewal dollars, so they can only be spent in this, in the urban renewal district, whereas, uh, we could uh, build a park along the river that is less uh, and uh, you can't uh, still use these monies there. Uh, so you may be looking at the program. Right, monies. So, but the 5.5 .5 million funding coming from the parks and rec bond, that money could be used for other parks. This right here. It, well, I guess you could ask, we're although it, it's not, there's, we're not using staff. bond. That's for the staff. That's so, Part of the yeah. question is where you can, can actually use the dollars in, in within the We don't the have to use the dollars, though. I mean, just because you have it doesn't mean you have to spend it. You're, you're correct. You could, we could build a park that only was a, a million and a half, and then the remaining money would still stay in the district to be spent within the urban renewal district. But we, already have, we already have nine million secured for this, so we're not building a million and a half. No, but I'm just using, you can choose, you know, along that scale, whatever you choose to to allocate towards this particular project. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Alan. Yeah, I think the uh, political answer to that question, just I've had similar ones asked of me, is that people often think that the city budget is one big homogenous big bucket that we can just pull out and use for anything, and it just ain't. So every, there's no such thing as money without strings. Everything has restrictions on it. And so you cannot use this money for that project. It has to be used within a context. Like John said, this is all urban renewal money. It cannot be used for any of those projects that you talked about. It has to be used within the boundaries of the urban renewal district. And so uh, if, if it doesn't get used on this park, it has to be used on something else within that district. It can't be, can't be used for any other purposes other than urban renewal, urban renewal district or front urban renewal district projects. So that's the way I explain it. Um, and, and people don't like that answer, but that's the reality of it. There's no such thing as uh, buckets of money without strings attached to them. Um, I don't have any issues with the, uh, the uh, park and the plaza funding request. I think these should be the highest priorities within the Riverfront Urban Renewal District. I think it's a very aggressive timeline. I uh, hope you're not setting yourselves up. Um, and in regard to the cost, uh, I thought, immediately thought of Chris saying you can have a fast, cheap, or right, but only two. And um, in this case, we're trying to do it fast and we're trying to do it right. So that adds to the cost. Um, my question is really about the funding of future projects and the table that was on the slide, but also on page 63 of our AAS or the third page of the, this one. And with $9.1 million remaining. So um, we have the steam plant, the affordable housing project, parking, eWeb headquarters, all within that, little, that geographical area, plus eight more other projects that are listed in the, in the, in the sub, uh, supplement to the AIS. So this doesn't seem like enough money. It's not. So how, uh, how do we pay for all this? What's the prioritization plan? Uh, my priority is the steam plant affordable housing project, parking, and then the EWEB project. The EWEB project, the reason I didn't vote for it to be City Hall, because it was a money pit. It needed a whole ton of money to, to put into it, and it was the most expensive option that we had in front of us. So that's why I put that down at the bottom of the, of the list. I'm willing to entertain looking at what we could do with it, but it's an enormously expensive project to, to deal with. Um, so uh, how, do, how, do we, how does that plan, how do we prioritize 
way too much appetite for uh, what we actually have to eat. Um, well, we don't have a plan yet, and uh, you're right in that um, when you look at what's the uncommitted funds, um, that there's not enough to go around. So what we were hoping was today is to kind of start that conversation with you all, and we're um, looking to the board to help us um, plan and prioritize those dollars in, in the future. So, um, you know, we're going to have some um, conversations with you to s start having specific conversations about projects. So we have um, on the 24th of this month, um, you're going to be presented with uh, the steam plant proposal and you'll get a better sense about their need. Um, and as John mentioned, we're going to be coming back to talk about the headquarters building. So um, I think we just, we need to be having more conversations with you to get a sense of what um, your priorities are you'd like us to think about when we're prioritizing use of those funds. Yeah, I, I suspect the affordable housing project is also going to come back with an, an extra. Yes. Budget. And then we always never forget about parking. Parking is one of the most Par expensive Parking is a critical issue. It's it's um, it's going to be, as, as that area, re as we um, develop um, the riverfront, particularly at the east end, we're going to have challenges there. And as we're learning, I think that the success of the steam plant is going to be uh, critical that we resolve some parking, uh, the parking issue in that area. Um, we're um, going to be having conversations with Williams and Dame and their partner um, for the ho affordable housing project soon. So we'll get a sense about what that gap is too. But right now we don't have any specific asks. We don't know exactly what those gaps are. We do know enough about the projects to know that $9 million is not enough to go for e even those first four or five that are related to the downtown riverfront project. Yeah, the one that we're worried most about is the parking because we're maxed out in our system in downtown already uh, in the facilities that we have and then we're adding a whole bunch of new stuff in that area without, I think, without an adequate plan for parking, which would be very expensive. Okay, Betty? Oh, thank you. I, guess. The, I, I was mistaken when I said we could just vote, obviously. <laughs> so optimistic. I thought, I thought everyone was persuaded this was a good thing, and we just say, okay. Um, back to the past, I, I'm opposed to urban renewal, partly because the money's too easy to spend. But we, I was voted down on that. We have the urban renewal. The money is there. It's like when we built the library. I was opposed to urban renewal, but when I first came on council, I found out they had all that money, so I said, why don't we put it into a library? Um, and I think this plan sounds good. I, I, uh, and I thought it had been explained to everybody, and everybody liked it, and it would be just vote for it, but it doesn't look that way. Um, I, my feeling is if you're going to do a big project, it would be better to have the, the citizens vote on it. And, but I'm prepared to vote for this now and worry about the other things later. Thank you. Okay. Emily. Thank you. Um, do we have to spend all the urban renewal money up to the cap? No, you, there's nothing that says you have to spend the money. Okay, well, some of us don't like urban renewal. It's robbing the property tax to the general fund, and that money could go to these these North Eugene parks. Um, I don't want to spend it all. Not that I don't think these projects are worthwhile, but because I don't like the mechanism of the funding. That being said, since we have this money, can we use some of it to pay for the park in the plaza and release some of this other money that we were going to put into that project that could go to other things. I'm trying to, could you just clarify your question? Well, well, the money that we're adding up to pay for these, a chunk is coming from urban renewal, but not all of it. Right. I, oh, so can we use some of this? Way. We're taking some out to repay general fund money with some of this. but. So, they, so, for example, the parks SDCs, right? Is that what you're, for example? Are those going into this park? There are some park SDCs in this park. So could we take those out of this and replace it with urban renewal money and use those SDCs for a different project? I think that is structurally possible, but it's up to you to decide. Well, I just offer it as a compromise, even using up the urban renewal funds I don't want to collect, that if, you know, we are going to spend them, can we spend more of it on this project and use some of the money we replace on some other competing projects that are also an equity issue? Please. What you're saying. 
uh, I guess the question would be, does that create a, so if there are $10 of parks SDC in the project and you replace those with $10 of urban renewal dollars, those $10 of SDCs now can get spent somewhere else mm -hmm. over here. That's mm -hmm. what you're asking. That's what I'm asking. Except that Thank only you. it's the eligibility line. Yeah, well, yeah, but I'm, my guess is the answer is yes. And then the question would be, where do you spend those other SDCs, which could be a different conversation right, at a different right, time. Right, I don't, don't want to do that so I part. guess the question would be, how much money is in the, in the SDC, parks SDCs in this project? That's the question. Six million. So, oh, there you go. Park SDC lot. dollars. So for this project? Yes. That's total. So there's no, a chunk total. of change that could go somewhere else, and we could use the urban renewal money. Right, um, so if trying to think about um, is there any implication that we would want to say we bring you the motion on uh, a Monday or we uh, do it right now if you want to make that change I'm just right trying now. to we'll make sure. enough I, I um, it, if we could just pause in this conversation yeah. before you make a motion and yeah. sort of get a little farther mm -hmm. along because yeah, it feels like it opens up a sort of Pandora's box of other things that we haven't thought right. through and yeah. that scares me that's quite what a bit. That's what I'm trying to think through. <laughs> so yeah. um, I was going to say, I hope we don't vote yeah, on this. The, uh, the other thing that I, that I was just, I mean, I'm sort of jumping in the queue, but, I, but the other thing that I wanted to say about this is that just based on Alan's comments, there is already insufficient funds in the Urban Renewal District to do this whole array of projects. And so there is a larger sort of big picture strategic question for you around this development as a huge economic development investment for the city of Eugene, that we see it as an economic engine. So there is the park, and that's the first piece out. But, but these other pieces are a huge part of our long-range plan around economic development. So that puts it in a sort of a different place. If you say you're going to take that money out, you're making a sort of a broader economic decision about how we invest dollars that we hope will produce economic development and tax revenue in the future to help us pay for some of these pieces. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean I to take away. I have a minute 43. I know, I jumped in because of, I, was, I was trying to avoid your motion, but you can come back. That was fine when my time was stopped. Oh, but they didn't stop, <laughs> they didn't sorry. stop my sorry. time. So just, I just wanted to put that out there in that conversation, I don't, and, but I need a motion to uh, extend. No. Motion to extend 10 minutes. Second. Thank you. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, however many there are, seven. We got it. Okay. You can continue now. Sorry. Thank you. I, I'm not necessarily looking to put a motion today, but I do want to put it out there that this is another choice. And since we don't have enough money for all these projects, obviously we're going to need to find some more. Where are we going to take it from? North Eugene's parks? We have a responsibility to the whole city. I think this is downtown park is important. It's exciting. I like it. I want to vote for it. But I have to listen to my colleagues and the rest of the city and make sure that we do have some equity. Not everybody comes downtown. I'm hoping this will bring them downtown. But maybe they'll feel better about it if they can also go play softball near their house. So I want us to be really careful how we spend this urban renewal money because it is coming from the general fund. So I don't know where that takes me as far as emotion, but I uh, think that, that I want to listen to my colleagues and, and propose that as an alternative compromise. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Um, I, I think Emily really got into a lot of the conversation I would have gotten into. Um, I want to be really mindful of my colleagues from North Eugene who have who have made a very persuasive point about um, uh, being able to fund things up in their area. Um, and I'm also intrigued by the notion of being able to utilize urban renewal money much more extensively in this project, which is within a riverfront urban renewal district. So rather than make a motion today, I would advise don't, let's not make a motion today. Um, I think we need to come back as soon as possible. Could be, it could be Monday, it could be as soon as we can, to be able to say what if we were able to fund what we're talking about here utilizing urban renewal money, which can only be spent within that district, um, and that would then free up funds, whether they're SDC or other funds, uh, which could be used 
in other areas, and, and what would that look like? And I'm perfectly conscious of the fact that it may require us to look at the terms of the Urban Renewal District, um, because its fundraising capacity may not be able to do that by 2024. But if you needed to extend it a year or two in, or, in able to accomplish this, it may be a way to have your cake and eat it too, um, which, which to me would be the best outcome, which is what I would be looking for. So I would re recommend we delay and look at what the opportunities might be to fund this fully out of the urban renewal and then use that money to um, try to program park development in, in North Eugene to the degree we can. So to me, that would be a best possible outcome, and I would encourage us to do that. Okay, I have Mike, Allen, and Betty for a second round. Nearly everything that Chris just said, and I was, I was actually going to say I hope my colleagues vote no if we have to vote, and I hope we don't vote. Um, but there's a much fuller conversation before I'm ready to vote on this in isolation because it doesn't exist in isolation, obviously. And I, it, is, it is challenging to hear some of my colleagues who uh, don't have up-to-date information about the costs of some of the other things we may spend this urban renewal money on. Um, and I would like to have a fuller conversation about what that looks like rather than decide to spend um, limited funds in isolation in advance. That's not a proper um, uh, comparison of priorities for us, I don't think. So I'm, I'm hopeful we don't vote or if we have to for some reason that we vote no so as we can have those fuller conversations first. Thank you. Alan. So, yeah, I'm not a big fan of, a, of, of urban renewal districts and the funding mechanism either. In fact, I voted for most of them. Um, on, in this particular one, there's $35 million cap left under the cap. This is $9 million for this project plus another $9 million for future projects, still about half the cap. So we're not spending up to the maximum amount. Um, so we're nowhere close to that. But um, the, there is said in here, AIS, 5.5 million coming from a combination of parks and transportation SDCs. Um, the transportation SDCs portion can't be used for parks in other parts of the city. It can be used for transportation. So we'd want to look at what parts transportation, what parts parks. And then the other question I would have is how much is in the SDC parks part total for the whole city? My guess is that that's tens of millions of dollars and that it's not a constraining factor in, for a lot of the short-term projects that we have. Um, so I don't know that we, in the long term, it creates constraint. In the short term, I'm not sure it does. So I, don't, I have that conversation as well. But then the final part of that analysis when we come back is that this is zero sum. If we take this uh, nine million or the five million or whatever, maybe it's four million dollars from parks at CCs and and uh, put it back into SDCs and use the urban renewal monies, that means the potential available for future projects is maybe cut in half. That means this list of all these projects within the urban renewal district can't do them all. Can't already do them all anyway. So what is it that we wouldn't do? We don't have a plan yet, but the question's still valid. What would we not do if we followed through and shifted out the SDCs for parks to use in other parks? Um, because that's the trade-off here. Betty, one more comment? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't think that this has anything to do with parks and other areas. It's a, total, it's a totally different kind of thing. The river belongs to the whole city. And it is, it's just, I just don't compare this to a, a neighborhood park. That's, that's another matter. We need those. But this, this is something for everybody. And I, and I think that's the way we should look at it instead of saying we're taking, and I, I, I'm disturbed by all the jealousies of different parts of the city saying we, you can't have that because we don't have something we need. But I taught at a high school once that was like that where they kept saying they get more than we do. I think that there are some things like the Ridgeline Trail, for example, and the river that obviously belong, and the river is not in my ward at all, I, that obviously belong to everybody. Thank you. Okay, and Jennifer, another yeah, round? I would oh. just like to point oh, yeah. out, though, sorry. No, go ahead. I'll wait. That inequity and jealousy are different. And most of the undeveloped yep. and areas that need acquisition are not in North Eugene. They're in West Eugene and Bethel. 
So this is a larger conversation than just about one part of the city. And um, just because some of us maybe feel like we need to take a broader look doesn't mean that we're jealous of different parts of the country. But people who have parks within walking distance, I am a little jealous about. So maybe it's both. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Manager. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, this has actually really been a really helpful conversation. And part of uh, what I take away is we do need to have a little bit broader conversation around a couple things. And but I also want to uh, um, not lose sight of sort of this particular project in the conversation. It's possible that we could have this broader conversation for many months and never quite get back around to this project. So, uh, so what, uh, what I uh, think uh, we can do to help is we can come back uh, soon, could be Monday, could be, I, I'd like to do it next week if possible, that uh, I don't hear a lot of uh, concerns about the scope of the project. Part of it is a funding source and what's the trade-off for those funding sources. I, I get that a little bit, Jennifer. So I, I did hear that, but I'm, I'm trying to sort of sense the, the table because the, the remember the, the amount of engagement in this in the broader community has been uh, pretty spectacular. And so what the, the broader community has said about the scope of the project is what you're what you're seeing. It's not just, we just kind of made that up. So that's a part of the scope. What we can do coming back on the funding source, we can also say, here's a, another recommendation, which could use a portion, uh, additional portion of this 9.1 million as a part of a trade-off for parks SDCs, which then could uh, free those up for a future time. I would be very, um, remiss in making a recommendation that you trade all of those off given the current um, um, capacity within the urban renewal district because I do think the steam plants coming back, the affordable housing are things that we really do want to, to do. Uh, at a future time, if it turns out that uh, you have an interest in funding more urban renewal projects, you want to expand the capacity, there, you can always, at that time, trade off any additional SDCs uh, within the next um, time period for uh, urban renewal money in the future as, as well. And so there is still a time in which we can move forward on this project and get it done. We'll come back with a recommendation on trading off a portion of those if you want to do that. But you could always trade off the rest of those at some time future as you have the broader conversations. Does that make sense? So at least that, that provides you some another option or recommendation on if you want to capture some of those SDCs back into the broader community, we'll bring them back a recommendation that we think I can do that, but also moves this project forward and doesn't spend all the dollars on a, 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 some of the things that are sort of on your horizon pretty quickly around this broader project. By Monday. We can do it. Well, our intent will be to, our, well, but, but I, our intent will be to come back next week with that. The, the piece is that if you want to have, before you take action on this, if you want that broader conversation about urban renewal districts and expanding the capacity, that's going to be a multiple month conversation. This project will not get done uh, in a couple, it, it's a very aggressive schedule. And so uh, as the time clicks off month after month, it's really difficult to stay on that. And so that's our, our intent will be to bring you back something next week that you can choose to talk right, about. Right, that, okay, that's what I would say. So the, it's the immediate question of the funding on this project that we want to address on Monday so we can proceed yes. and give right. some certainty to the timeline. All right, did you have something Just you need quick, to ask? Yeah. The, the thing that you mentioned, yes, the, I complain about the 2.5, but this is a good project that everybody needs. One of the costs we're not talking about that's bothering me and I sense others are the opportunity costs. We're not talking about those, and if we run into them later, that's going to be a problem. So maybe we don't have to go back and reassess everything, but we have to be very clear about what the opportunity cost of the choices are with that money for the for other projects. Yes. Because if we run into, oh, we can't later, that's where the problem's going to be. Yeah, the, and we don't need to go down this rabbit hole, but the choice of you can't will depend on what action, policy actions you're wanting to pursue, right? Yeah. I mean, so that, that'll be, 
this council will have that opportunity to have those conversations well, before, uh, before this decision. And, and a reminder that this project has been before you many times and for a long time. So this is not a sudden, quick decision that you're faced with. You have been following and approving this process as we have moved along. So um, keeping that in mind, it's part of a larger, larger project. Eddie, I so. so wish you would put out your first motion. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And we will talk about this again on Monday. We're adjourned. <laughs>